We are Hope Church Guildford. This is a recent recording from our Sunday morning gathering. We hope you can join us at the Royal Grammar School on Guildford High Street, Sundays at 10 a.m. Enjoy the message. Good morning. My name's Patrick. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm married to Kate, and we have two daughters, Evelyn and Ada. Uh, as a family, we've been coming to Hope Church for quite a few years now. Uh, we help with the church youth group, and um, outside of work, my job is that I help to run a group of state schools in Guildford. I'm also, on a voluntary basis, a leader at Urban Saints Guildford, which is a Christian youth group based on Stoke Park that reaches out to boys, both from church and unchurch backgrounds across Guildford. So obviously, having uh, seen the Olympics start over the last few days, this series suddenly now seems really topical, um, and it's exciting to see the competitions progress and medals coming in and to uh, reflect on uh, on what that means in terms of this series that we're going through as a church. It's great to hear Henry's video earlier uh, and I hadn't realised we had so many people in the church that are involved in high level sports so it's great to understand more about that and Henry's experiences. And I thought it was really interested, interesting when he talked about um, how difficult it can be when training and competitions don't go as you expect or plan uh, and I would just want to kind of pick up on that theme this morning. Uh, while I certainly don't have a reputation as being a great athlete, um, I was involved in rowing when I was at university, and from that short experience uh, in sort of the sporting world, I uh, certainly understand how, tra- how training can be gruelling and tiring, and particularly fitting uh, training and sport in around other things in life, um, and that when things are going wrong, it can be really difficult and tempting to, uh, to give up or to feel there isn't a way forwards. And I think that's a feeling that can extend into the rest of life as well. It's not just limited to a sporting context, perhaps at home as a situation or at work or church or in your Christian life that can make us tired or, or weary or, or feel uh, feel overwhelmed. And I just want to kind of talk a little bit more about that kind of feeling this morning and what the Bible has to say about that. Uh, just as a little analogy, we've recently got back from holiday we went away with uh, with Kate's um, family, and uh, Kate's sister-in-law had a new fitness tracker that uh, that she was wearing, and she pointed out to us it has a, a sort of a battery icon on it, um, and this tracker kind of monitors your sleep and tells you in the morning kind of how how fully charged you are, how how full your battery is for the day, and then it monitors your activity during the day and uh, sort of tells you how much energy you've got left, and I uh, I thought it would be kind of interesting to know what what my battery icon would say. Um, and to be honest, I sometimes wonder if uh, if I had one of these, whether it'd be a bit like a ten year old laptop, you know, where you uh, you spend the whole day charging the thing up and it doesn't ever really go above two thirds, and then you use it for a little bit, it runs down a bit, and then gets to about a third, and then just suddenly disappears off and dies because there's no power left. Sometimes that's that's certainly how I feel. Um, and I don't know how you feel this morning and, and how full you feel your battery is, but if you feel that your battery is depleted, that you're tired or weary or overwhelmed, then I believe God has something to say to you this morning. So we're going to uh, have our reading now. Um, so the reading is from the book of Isaiah, uh, who was an Old Testament prophet. So he, uh, he spoke to people in a country called Judah before the time of Jesus, about, about 700 years BC. Um, and I just want to uh, just put a little bit of context behind what we're going to read in Isaiah today. Um, so Isaiah spoke to uh, people in what's, what's now modern-day Israel, um, and he uh, he spoke in about 700 BC, and one of the things he did was he warned them that they were, as a country, going to be taken over, defeated and taken over by a country called Babylon. Um, and that was an amazing inspired prophecy, because about 100 years after Isaiah said it, exactly that happened. Um, and Jude got taken uh, taken away, or well, people got taken away into a different country called Babylon, where they lived in exile for about 70 years. Uh, and you'll remember that we recently had a series on Ezra and Nehemiah, which talked about uh, the time that God then returned them back to uh, back to their land, back to the land of Judah. So after about chapter 40 in Isaiah's book, he, he seems to sort of switch audience, and rather than writing to people that were com- his compatriots in the present day, he appears to be speaking to the Jews in Babylon shortly prior to that, that time of return. Um, so he's talking to a people that are in a foreign land um, and that, that really kind of don't, don't know what's going to happen to them or in that uncertainty. So we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 40 uh, verses 27 to 31. So just reading that now it says, 
Why do you complain, O Jacob? Why do you say, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But to those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So it's an incredible uh, passage here that I just want to step through during this talk. Um, In verse 27, we hear the cries of a nation feeling abandoned by God. Uh, Just reading verse 27 again. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. So this is a nation that's away from home in a society that doesn't respect their faith, that's unable to see a way forwards in their struggles. Perhaps that rings a bell with some of the situations that, that we're in. Uh, maybe there are personal situations that, you, that you're struggling with at the moment, perhaps a situation in a family relationship that just seems to be hopeless, uh, perhaps a problem with your job that either it's, it's sort of not stable or uh, stressful or not fulfilling that you just can't see a way forwards in. Perhaps there's a financial problem that you just can't see a way to overcome. But even on a wider level, outside of our, our pure sort of personal law bits, you just have to open a newspaper to realise some of the challenges nationally and globally that face us today and perhaps wonder if there is hope in the future of this world. Our nation is increasingly godless and, and doesn't really care what God's got to say. The world is increasingly uncertain. Uh, geopolitical things going on and with, uh, with sort of wars and uh, economic crises and other political issues is a time of, of great uncertainty. We should remember that the Jews in exile were in Babylon, but they were seeing other empires rise and fall around them. They would have been wondering whether there was hope for their faith and their nation in amongst all that turbulence. These words were as relevant to us today as it was for them. Looking at verse 28, Isaiah encourages us to step back and remember the God that we worship, to remember who he is, for he's bigger than any of the troubles we face. He reminds us that we worship the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. This chapter, chapter 40, is one of the great chapters in the Bible in reminding us of God's majesty and magnificence. I'm not going to have time to read the uh, the whole chapter now, but um, I'm going to just uh, refer to a few verses that I just think kind of put this, this really in perspective and remind us of how great God is. In verse 12, he says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance. Verse 15, he says, Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Verse 24, he brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. So it's clear that God is ultimately in control of everything that happens in our world, however hard it may be for us to make sense of that. And when we're overwhelmed, we should remind ourselves of who God is, and he's so much bigger than any situation we can face. Just as a personal example of where I found this helpful, I need you here to cast your uh, minds back to the start of the COVID pandemic. If you remember the, the kind of chaos at the start of the first lockdown, where there was lots of uncertainty and the schools were open and then they were closed and uh, it wasn't clear whether people were going into work or what was going to happen and you had to stay at home. There was nothing on the supermarket shelves. There was all that uncertainty going on. And uh, and for us, there was a, some additional factor that our, elder, our younger daughter, Ada, was born just a few days before that. Um, and actually, right at the start of that first lockdown, Kate and Ada had to go back into hospital. Uh, because Ada was was losing weight, it was something that long term wasn't a problem. But at the time, the last thing anybody wanted to do was go anywhere near a hospital. So that was a it was a difficult time for us. It was a difficult time for many people. But I remember being at home, struggling to make sense of what was going on, and in particular, struggling to explain and reassure our older daughter Evelyn, who at the time was five, so uh, aware of what's going on, but not not really able to understand. And as a naturally very rational person, I'm from an engineering background, I like to work things through logically, I, I really struggled to make sense of things. Um, and I found that the only thing I could really do was to remind myself of who God is, all the great things he'd done for us. And that I found when I focused on uh, on God and 
um, how strong and powerful he is and all those things he'd done, how faithful he is, that gave me a real sense of confidence that he would have things in hand. So then we move to verses 29 to 31, uh, which is a really powerful passage about renewal. Um, in verse 30, we're reminded that human strength isn't enough. How often do we rely on our own strength to overcome problems rather than relying on God? How often do we worry about things or jump to practical actions before stopping to pray or to commit things to God? The example I just gave earlier was an example of where it was a situation that I, I had no control of. And that was made it, what made it difficult to me for me because I, I like to be able to control situations. But in this case, it, it was beyond my ability to, to control and, uh, and understand. And that was what made it so hard. Even on a national or global level, our society no longer looks to God to help us solve issues. Instead, we seek to do so through our own wisdom or cultural values or technologies, regardless of whether those things actually have a track record of working. Even when our society does mention God or refer to God, it's often in name only, um, without realising that actually we do need to do things God's way. We do need to actually let God intervene rather than just uh, claiming some nice things that, that God refers to. Uh, there's, a, there's an image on the slides here. I don't know if anyone knows what this, this building is. Um, it's the United Nations building in New York. And outside that building, uh, there's a stone wall and there's a picture of that wall here. And you can see on it, there are, uh, there are some words here from Isaiah. Um, and they're, they're great words. I'll read them now. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will take up sword against, so nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So that's from Isaiah chapter two, verse four, and it's a it's a lovely quotation, and it's really fitting for it to be on the wall of a building like the UN building. But unfortunately, they've, they've missed half the verse. And actually, I, I'm going to put on on the screen now that the full verse, and I've put in italics at the beginning the phrase that's missed. So the, the words that are on the stone are all about the outcomes and, and what we might achieve. But what's been missed is how we will achieve it. Um, there's no mention of God in what's on the wall. But actually the first phrase of that verse is, he will judge between the nations and settle disputes for many peoples. This state of affairs will come about when God intervenes, not something that will come about through human strength. The reason the Bible reminds us of human weakness is not to discourage us but it's to remind us that we need to rely on God if we're to succeed. And God reminds us of that because he wants us to succeed. He wants us to rely on him and benefit from his strength and power. Verse 29 is a real encouragement. Um, he gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even if you already feel totally overwhelmed, it's amazing this idea that strength might come to the weary, the weak might be given power. The Hebrew words here suggest almost a transfer of power like God is, providing some of his power to those that need it. And it's totally countercultural. In our society, of course, the strong and successful tend to succeed and the weak tend to be left behind. And this is a reminder to us that God's kingdom works very differently to the kingdoms of earth. Perhaps you're here this morning feeling your battery is low or facing a situation you can't see a way out of, maybe believing you're a failure. Well, this message is for you. There is hope to, for you through God. With God's help, we can endure and overcome difficulties that would otherwise overwhelm us. Verse 31, now this, this for me is the best bit. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? If, um, if there was something that did this in the Olympics, it would be banned as a performance enhancing drug. But actually, this is what God is saying is true through, through the words of Isaiah. It's hugely powerful. Um, and I, I just want to unpack what it means here to hope in the Lord. Because that, that seems to be what, what we are expected to do um, and, and our part to play in, uh, in, in, real, in um, receiving God's strength uh, and blessing in these words. So hope is a, a really important word. Um, obviously, we chose it to be in the, in the name of our church. Um, and in, in the English dictionary, it's defined as an expectation or desire for a better state. But of course, the book of Isaiah wasn't written in English. It was written in Hebrew. Um, and the word used in Hebrew doesn't actually have a direct translation in English. It, it translates to a number of English words. Um, and some other translations in the Bible use phrases like wait on the Lord or trust in the Lord instead of hope in the Lord. So it means kind of a combination of those phrases. And the word used, I'm just bring on the screen now, is kavar. Um, so it means a combination of hope, trust, 
to wait expectantly or to look out for and anticipate. Um, and I just want to give some examples of where that word is used elsewhere in the Bible and try and give you a sense of what a Hebrew person would have understood when that word was used. It's a word that's derived from a word used in rope making. Um, so it seems to refer to a, a sense of tension in a tightened cord. Uh, so if you pull an elastic cord and put that tension into the cord, there's, there's this kind of anticipation that at some point someone's going to let go and that tension will be released. And that, you know, that could be quite violent when an elastic cord pulls back. Um, so there's this sense that something's going to happen, that there's a, there's a tension. Kavar is an active word, not a passive word. So this isn't about when we say wait on the law. We're not talking about sitting in a waiting room, checking our watch, kind of getting bored. That's not what it means at all. It's a, it's a much more active form of waiting. So an, an analogy might be when you're waiting for a baby to be born. I, if I think back to when our elder daughter Evelyn was uh, was was sort of due to be born, uh, there was a real sense of excitement that we had at home, a sense of anticipation about what was going to happen. We needed to prepare and get ready. There were things to do. We were eagerly awaiting. Uh, those around us were eagerly awaiting her arrival. It's that kind of sense of tension and anticipation that's in this word, uh, not just a kind of passive waiting. The word kavar is used in many other places in the Bible and uh, a couple of examples to share. So one is in Psalm 130 verses 5 to 7. It says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. In his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. So there's a couple of things in here that I think are relevant. One is this phrase, my whole being waits. This is a form of waiting that encompasses one's whole being. It's not just something you can kind of do while getting on with other things, but actually it, it, it's really involved and involves uh, the psalmist's whole being. Also, he refers to watchmen waiting for the morning. Well, of course, a watchman waiting for the morning has a really high level of confidence that the morning will actually come. It's, it's going to happen. This isn't a kind of wistful hope like maybe I'll win the lottery next week. This is something we're really confident in and we really think is actually going to happen. There's another example in Isaiah. In chapter 5, Isaiah uh, recounts a parable. Uh, and It's a parable about a farmer who prepares a vineyard. And the farmer chooses a fertile site for his vineyard and he clears all the stones, he prepares the ground, he plants his vines. Um, and even when he's done that, he then builds a watchtower and a wine press and he then sits back and waits expectantly. He cavars, knowing he's done all the, all the work he needs to do. And he waits and anticipates that good crop of grapes arriving. To be clear, cavar isn't just optimism. So optimism is choosing a favourable view of a or positive view of a particular set of circumstances. So that's not what Kavar is about. And similarly, Kavar isn't just weighing up the odds or calculating the probability and deciding something's likely. It's not looking out of the window and saying, oh, the storm clouds out there, I, I'm going to expect it to rain. That That's just looking at circumstance around us. Kavar is something different. It's about a, a choice or a decision to trust, to wait, to expect. Even if... Even if we think the thing might not be that likely, even if we think that God's promise sounds really unlikely given our circumstances, it's about a confidence that God will come through and will deliver. And of course, if we if we read our Bibles, and it, it was great to hear earlier an encouragement to, to read our Bibles more. Um, if we read our Bibles, we just see the Bible is packed full of examples of where God promises things and delivers. Just picking up some examples around the Jewish people. So, of course, when they were uh, were slaves in Egypt. Uh, God remembered his people and he rescued them from slavery through Moses. When his people were in exile in Babylon, he remembered them. He was faithful and returned them to their land. 400 years later, after many years of silence and wondering what was going on, uh, he sent his son Jesus to earth to die and to save his people from their sins. And in each of those examples, years had passed. People said God had forgotten, but he hadn't and he was faithful. God remembers us today in Guildford. People may say he's absent or irrelevant or doesn't exist, but he's as present and active as ever and extends his offer of salvation to us all through Jesus. There are examples in the Bible of individuals who have had to wait for God to fulfil his promises to them. So two examples that uh, that I think might be helpful to talk through this morning, one, one being Abraham. So Abraham was an old man. He was about 75 years old. 
and childless, uh, when God said to him that he would have a son and heir and would become a great nation. But that didn't happen nine months later. Abraham had to wait. He had to wait about 25 years. And as he grew older, as he turned 80 and 90 and even 100, he must have thought that God had forgotten or that something had gone wrong. But God remembered and was faithful and delivered him that son. David uh, was anointed uh, by Samuel and told he would become the new king of Israel. And in some ways, that wasn't great for David because he then became a real target for Saul, the king at the time, who wasn't a great fan of the idea that someone else would become king instead of him. Uh, David had to flee for his life and eventually had to flee the country, uh, went into hiding and then fled the country. And he was in that state for a long time, fearing for his life. He had to wait about 15 to 20 years before he actually became king. His life was under threat through that time, and he must have doubted. In fact, we know from the Psalms that he did doubt and felt God had abandoned him. But actually, God hadn't. David and Abraham both had to wait a long time, but God deliver on his promises, did deliver on his promises. God's promises do sometimes take time. God's promises aren't like a microwave meal or quick cook pasta that we get from the supermarket with a big star on the side telling us that it only takes two, three minutes in the microwave. It's not an instant thing. With God, we have to wait and be patient sometimes. And that can be really hard for us in our short term society. But we need to remember our culture is all about instant solutions that may look attractive, but are often shallow and full of false promise. We've just gone through a general election campaign, and it's amazing how quick politicians are to uh, to suggest how they're going to make everything better very quickly and with minimal pain. But in reality, they're just short term promises to try and get support and power. Uh, similarly, we're bombarded with advertising for different products and experiences that will allegedly make our, our lives immediately better. But they often don't deliver and actually are just a self-serving way of getting our money. Well, God's promises do often take time. They do often require patience and waiting. But the difference is he's faithful and true. He can be trusted and he can be relied upon. And that is certainly the better approach for us to take. It's interesting to compare Abraham and David. There's an interesting distinction between them. So Abraham, for those who know the story, uh, of course, did lose confidence at one point in God fulfilling his promise and took matters into his own hands. He had a child with a servant girl, um, believing that, that maybe that was what was needed to fulfil God's plan. And that didn't work out well for Abraham. It wasn't God's plan, and that had significant implications for his family uh, and for the future of his people. David, conversely, had the opportunity to take matters into his own hands as well. There was, in particular, an occasion when Saul came into a uh, Saul, the king of Israel, of Israel at the time, came into a cave where David and his followers were hiding. David had the opportunity to kill him and take the throne, but David recognised that it wasn't for him to decide the timing, and so he let Saul go uh, and trusted God. And ultimately, in God's time, the throne was given to David. So what David got right and Abraham got wrong. So we can trust God to fulfil his promises in his own time. We don't need to rely just on our own strength. And in some ways, this is where the Olympic analogy breaks down. Because if you're an athlete, success does come down to your own strength. It comes down to your own training and discipline, diet and talent. And ultimately, if you're not strong enough or fast enough or talented enough, you won't be a success. Well, being a Christian is very different. God expects us to make an effort to live the way he wants. He expects us to use the abilities he's given us. But ultimately, success in our Christian life isn't just down to us. It's down to Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And it's down to the Holy Spirit working in our lives every day. So we should find life as a Christian much more reassuring as a prospect than life as an athlete. Because success isn't down to us. And we have every reason to be confident because success is down to God. If you're an athlete, you might talk about uh, positive attitude and confidence and lots of athletes do talk about their confidence and their success but ultimately only one athlete will win there are eight athletes going to line up at the start line of the 100 meter sprint in a few days time but only one of them will win for seven of them their confidence will prove to be misplaced however confident they may have been but as a christian we can all have full and genuine confidence because of these words of isaiah these words that say that those who cover on god who trust hope and wait in God, will soar on wings like eagles, will run and not grow weary, will walk and not be faint. When we're weak in our own strength, God's strength can energise us. 
And as I said before, this wording implies there's this kind of transfer of power from God, that God puts his power onto the weak and weary so that we can overcome the challenges that we face. Now, Isaiah uses in his words the analogy of an eagle, and I thought it might be helpful to just think about the characteristics that this might suggest. There's some images, images on the screen from various human civilizations, and throughout history, the eagle has been used as a powerful symbol in human civilization. There's a coin here, a Greek coin, ancient Greek coin that has the eagle on it. The Roman legions, of course, used to uh, used to rally behind a, a, an eagle um, banner at the, at the at the front of the uh, the legions, and the even the U.S. presidential seal today has a, a, a an eagle on the seal, and that's because the eagle represents power and majesty and success. In the Bible, the image of an eagle appears in several places, and again has similar sorts of meaning as a symbol of youth, of power, of protection, and strength. In Exodus nineteen verse four. God says to the Israelites after they left Egypt, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So we associate the eagle with these powerful characteristics. But we should remember why we do that. Because we envisage an eagle as a majestic bird soaring over mountainous terrain. But the reality is that those mountains are a really difficult place to live. We see images of And I've got one on the screen here of uh, eagles nesting high up in trees or on cliffs, perhaps on a rocky ledge at the top of a cliff. Well, the reason they do that is not because it looks impressive, but it's because they're in danger. And that is a place of protection, a place where their nest will be safe. The reason they soar majestically is because they're looking for food. If they don't do that, they can't survive. So the eagle is a majestic bird and a powerful bird, but it lives in a harsh location. It lives in a location with lots of difficulties and challenges. And it has to overcome those. And as Christians, the reality is we live in a world that is hostile to our faith. Jesus is clear that there's a cost to following him, that there are challenges to overcome. He doesn't say he will take the challenges away, but he does say he will give us the strength to overcome them. To the Jews that Isaiah was writing to, who of course were still captives in Babylon, the words gave confidence that God hadn't forgotten. The words gave them strength to keep going. But they didn't immediately remove their problem. They didn't immediately take them home. They still had those problems that they had to overcome with that encouragement from Isaiah and that strength that comes from God. Of course, we know ultimately God returned them to their land. In the same way, we know ultimately God is going to come back to this earth to solve the problems that we face. So just uh, as we wrap up, I just want to reflect back on my very, very limited uh, experience as an athlete. I don't want anyone to get the impression this was in any way illustrious, but the time I spent rowing... um, did sort of give me an idea of an analogy here and it's a bit of a niche reference I'm afraid but I hope it will be useful. So there's a form of racing in rowing called bumps racing and there's a picture on the screen that shows this Um, and the idea is that a whole series of crews line up in a line and have an equal gap between each crew uh, and a cannon goes off and all the boats will, will row in the same direction and the idea is you're trying to catch up the crew in front of you And you're trying to do that before the crew behind you catches you. And the idea is you actually physically make contact with the crew you're you're chasing. And when you do that, your race is over and those two crews pull in. You've won and they've lost. And um, the the reason I share this as an analogy is it's actually quite a difficult form of racing because in a rowing boat, of course, you look backwards. You can't see where you're going. All you can see is what's behind you. And so all you can see when you're racing in this kind of race is the crew that's bearing down on you. So when you get tired and you see the other crew coming towards you, that's all you can see. It's all you can focus on. And it can mean you you feel that it's inevitable you'll be caught. It means you can get disheartened. It means you can be tempted to to give up or lose confidence. Similarly, if you you do get close to catching the crew you're chasing, when you get close to them, the water gets choppy because you're in in the wake of their boat. So suddenly the rowing feels scrappy. You feel like it's all starting to fall apart. And so again, it's tempting to give up and focus more on the boat that's chasing you and forget the fact that actually you're you're really close to winning, you're doing well. Well, I think sometimes we in our lives need to remember that actually we, we need to stop focusing on the problems that we face, however big and looming they may be. Sometimes we need to stop focusing on the choppy waters we're in uh, and where things are going wrong. We need to stop focusing on how weak or weary or tired we feel. We need to look up and focus on God. We need to remember that we have God's strength. We need to remember we're on the winning side. We need to remember that God gives us the strength to keep going. 
We need to keep on going, keep on striving to follow God. We need to kavar, we need to hope in God, trust in God, wait on God and have confidence in God that he will bring the strength we need to to overcome and endure. Thanks for listening. We meet on Sundays at 10am at the Royal Grammar School in Guildford. We look forward to seeing you.